Hi everyone, can people hear me? Alright, let's get started for today. Recording in progress. Okay, okay, so welcome to day two of our catalyst. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm Jenny, the Jenny that you see a lot of emails from. <laughs> Well, uh, just one house uh, housekeeping item before we get started today. Um, so today you'll see you have refreshments, you have lunch, and you also have a reception at the end of the day. Uh, so throughout the day, if you're hungry, you will feel like you want to eat something, um, this room picks up every noises. So let's uh, keep the food outside if we can, or chew very quietly. Uh, otherwise, your face will be featured uh, for our virtual <laughs> audience. If you don't mind, then I don't mind. Okay, uh, so that's that. And then uh, let's kick it off to uh, Cindy. So good morning, everyone. I'm Cindy Housen, Chief Data Strategy Officer of ThoughtSpot, an AI-powered analytics platform and host of the Data Chief podcast, one of the most popular podcasts that you can hear from data and AI leaders from around the world. Um, people like Tom Davenport or Suzette Kent, our former uh, CIO of the Federal Data Strategy or um, the CDO of MasterCard, some, some great minds, for example, to hear from. So it's Saturday. What, what are we doing in a classroom on Saturday? Oh my gosh. It takes some passion, right? But I think we have to start with a quiz. Oh, the moans already. Do, do you still, I still have nightmares about showing up late for my final exam. It shows you what an overachiever I am in school. So what I would like, and this also applies to the people joining us from around the world online, you can actually do this with your family, whoever is eavesdropping on your class. But it's very important to me that you do this together and do this aloud, OK? I'm going to ask you to truly picture a word that I'm going to give you. And then I am going to ask you a question about this, all right? So what I want everyone to do together we're going to repeat the word white 10 times really quickly. Are you ready? And just picture it, okay? Ready? White, 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 white. Quiz, what do cows drink? I heard that loud and clear, Michael. <laughs> Pass fail. The answer is not milk. <laughs> now, they do, uh, yes, but I didn't say calves. Whoever said that? Whoever, was that you, Allison, who was arguing with me? <laughs> so what's interesting, what you all just did, we could say that this really is a hallucination. This is what generative AI will do. Generative AI is just predicting the next word in a series. And what goes more together with white and a cow is they make milk. But I said, what do they drink? So our brains, we do this thing, confabulation. Our brains skip and, and substitute a word. So I think what's interesting in the AI community, it's things like this where you all said with a high degree of confidence that it is milk, which is absolutely wrong. And this is what happens with generative AI. It will give us the predicted next word with a high degree of confidence. And it is the thing that scares the life out of everyone. I thought it was very interesting yesterday, our two financial services panelists, the first reaction is just shut down all access to GPT. The country of Italy shut down all access to GPT. 
for a lot of different valid reasons, but this is one of the things that we have to educate ourselves on and take mitigation strategies. So I do, the title is, Will AI Destroy Humanity or Make It Better? I am an optimist. I actually believe it will unleash the creativity of humankind. It will cure healthcare diseases at a faster rate than we could humanly do. But I'm an optimist and I see the good in the world and there's a lot of people that would really like to use it to destroy countries, to further inequities. So to me, in, in this session, I want to first take you through what is the state of AI from some different industries. I'll talk about what are different approaches to regulation and what are mitigation strategies you can take to ensure that we unleash the good and prevent the bad. I'll share with you some things. We had a lively debate about the role of education and I want everyone here both as senior educators, educators within your organizations, but also as perhaps parents, aunts, uncles, to think about what we can do earlier as well. And then how the roles are changing in data and analytics. And then we'll conclude with some Q&A. So let's look at some of the good in the world. So actually an AI program developed here at Harvard in conjunction with the Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute is accelerating the detection of a number of cancers. We have it with lung cancer, breast cancer. I like the case study of an AI program, SIBO, that is being used to detect cancer, pancreatic cancer, actually three years before most people would ever go to a doctor with symptoms using data just from the medical records. So before we have these expensive scans as well. So when we think about equity, who can actually afford to go to a doctor, and we think about the disparity of when people from lower incomes or different um, ethnic races might go to seek health care later, if we can mine their medical records earlier, and actually prevent it from getting too late. To me, this is the good of AI. AI is also really fun. And what surprises me is the number of teens that do not know they can search their phones by word, cat, dog, city, time, place. So yes, I do have over 300 pictures of my dog, Doc. <laughs> 120 pound Bernadoodle. The family promised me he would only be 60 to 80 pounds. Clearly that predictive model was a little off. And for you cat lovers, the cats, my cats actually do have 20 more pictures than my dogs. Than my dog, so um, <laughs> I might say I had the cats longer. But it can categorize photos, which I think is great and fun. Can I just hit escape, I think the clicker different menu came up. Thank you. Okay. That's some of the good news, the fun news, but there's also some bad news. And we think about um, black patients, for example, going to hospitals actually in the Boston area with symptoms of potential kidney disease. The way race was used in a different way for a particular set of algorithms, actually a third of black patients who had severe kidney uh, disease were categorized incorrectly of not having a severe disease. And 64 of those patients, should black patients, should have been put on the high priority kidney transplant plant list, and they were not because of what the algorithm recommended based on their race. What concerns me more is the way the doctors just used the recommendations from the algorithms without questioning it. So one of the mitigation strategies is we always have to have human in the loop. It's the human plus AI 
that gets us to a better place. Just taking the AI at absolute is one of the biggest risks. With that said, we know that we are not having enough nurses, enough doctors. So the AI productivity without getting to the bias is something we have to think about. Another use case, let's look at generative AI. In academia, our students, how many of our students are actually using AI, generative AI, chat GPT, to write their papers? We do not have consistency in how educators are thinking of this. Some are saying, yes, use it as your first draft, whereas other schools are banning it outright. However, an algorithm with Turnitin, one of the plagiarism checkers, is actually disproportionately flagging plagiarism for students of English as a second language. And it's because of their writing style, it's a little more um, structured, a little more rigid. So imagine if you are that 15-year-old and you are accused of cheating based on an algorithm. The degree that the teachers understand that Turnitin and AI uh, cheating checkers are only predicted models, the degree that the teachers understand this is highly variable. But the damage to that student of being falsely accused of cheating, there's no way of taking that back. Let's go even a little further when we talk about mental health. And there have been a few examples of bots gone wrong with mental health. I can't think of an area more fragile. The National, Eating, um, the National Association of Eating Disorders used a rule-based chat bot to give information. It was rule-based. It was tried, tested, vetted. But because it was outsourced, the outsourcer inserted a more GPT-based, AI-based, generative AI-based bot, unbeknownst to the National Eating Disorders Association. And so when somebody asked for advice, it gave them advice on going on particular diets. You do not want to give diet advice for someone with an eating disorder. Uh, Tessa is the uh, bot. Once they discovered this, of course they disabled it. But think of how quickly these things are happening, unbeknownst to us, unbeknownst to the providers. So this is where some of the harms, <laughs> I like clicking down rather than too far up. Um, so what do we do about it? Is regulation the answer? And we had a very lively debate yesterday around some of the privacy regulations. I see regulation, and, and there is a lot happening. So as we saw with privacy, the EU, I think, is very much ahead on this front. They've had their guidelines of explainable AI, um, transparent AI. I like some of the rules coming out of the UK that also includes a component for education. In the US so far, we're mainly regulating or giving guidance to the federal agencies what they are allowed to do. And as a few speakers alluded to yesterday, we expect something from the White House on Monday. Maybe it's a new AI Bill of Rights, we'll see. But these are all frameworks. And then we really are leaving it up to each, each agency and each state to decide what's allowed. So in California, uh, privacy was implemented at the state level because we couldn't agree at a federal level. Facial recognition, its use or its banning is being agreed upon by local police departments and again at the state level. I see regulation as far too late in the process to be useful. I also see regulation as the absolute moral minimum. So for you that are building AI models or deploying them, it's about being proactive sooner, much earlier. So what, and, and also next week, one, another thing to watch for is the Prime Minister of the UK, Sunak, has called 
a hundred leaders, developers, regulatory policymakers together to come out with some policies now because of course the UK is separate from the EU. Um, so policies around what to do with AI regulation and also as they call them these frontier models, the ones that have outsized impact and are earlier. Oh, I also do want to point out, I was um, sharing this with Michael this morning. This image actually was AI generated. I created this using Bing and Dolly. In my opinion, one mitigation strategy, tag the image. Don't make me put it on here. And a concern I have, this image looks like something um, that, that uh, Oh, uh, now I'm going to forget the name of Getty. Getty Images. It looks very similar to a Getty image that I've seen in a number of public articles. So was um, <coughs> Bing Dolly trained on this? Should they get royalties from it? Maybe. The other thing is, in creating this image, I just asked for a judge with an AI bot. I did not ask for a white male. Isn't it interesting that that is the default that, that it puts out, right? By, by a set scale. So a few mitigation strategies you can take. And this is some survey results from McKinsey. Over a thousand companies responded to this. Is the first one, actively checking for biased data in the training data set. And we are not doing this enough. A next one, establishing a governance committee. This governance committee should not only be internal. Internal, your goal may be profitability and releasing the model as quickly as possible. And also think about your teams, how many believe in the value and the good of AI. Your governance committee, I want somebody outside who has an evil mind, because I don't have that evil mind. I want them to tell me all the ways your AI platform will be used to harm people. And I also want people with disparate impact. So I want minorities where we might have risks of bias at scale as part of my governance committee. How you fund it becomes another area. Because once they're on your payroll, are they going to tell you what you don't want to hear? Or might you remove them from the committee? So if I were working in Washington, I would look for something like an AI tax, where it is mandatory and we kind of fund this for the good of everyone. So who pays for that? Human in the loop, always. Never just create, never just accept the AI. And then documentation that explains the weights in a way that a lay person can interpret it, in a way that a teacher, a doctor, a police enforcer could interpret it. So where do we stand? The way McKinsey divided this, the purple bar is the leaders, those that are further ahead um, and they defined a leader based on how long they've been doing AI and the business impact. Only a third of the leaders are actually looking for bias in the data set. And then the rest of the survey base, 24%. Who here thinks that's an acceptable level? Anyone? This is, this is where the problem starts. The models are trained on biased data. If you'll accept my belief that all data is biased, it's what are the mitigation strategies to compensate for that biased data set. This is an area that I think generative AI has some potential to help, maybe by bringing in things like synthetic data. But recognizing where your data may have gaps and biases and compensating for that in the algorithm if you're not even recognizing the biases in the data, huge failure. <clears throat> Governance committee, again, less than a quarter, even across the, the leaders. Human in the loop, only 40%. This should be always, always, just always. And explaining the weights is even less. The issue here is fear that I will be giving away my secret sauce, my IP. 
And this is what I, we do see most of the regulation saying you must make it explainable. Is that actually happening? We see it's quite different. So one machine learning expert researcher and now the chief data officer at Etsy, the online retailer, Shin Xiao, talked about how, you know, in academia, we really are measured on algorithm improvement. How much did our model compare to the previous model? And we're never going back and understanding the data. So for academia, I think this is a huge miss. And even my son actually just completed his master's in data science and business analytics. And he learned a lot about use cases and developing the code, but not where the data really comes from or how to structure that data. So I would say for anyone working in education, this is an area of improvement. Andrew Eng actually did a hackathon to say, can we educate people further here? Another person whose work I follow, and I highly recommend her book, she also has a new book out, Professor Ruha Benjamin from Princeton University. And her book, Race After Technology, actually recently was named a must read by the Wall Street Journal for anyone working in AI, data, and analytics. And she talks about how if you think about the ways that we collect data, there's a lot of systemic biases, historical ways of thinking, and if we're training the models based on this biased data, going back in time. So let's go back 30, 40 years ago, the concept of redlining, who you give a credit card or a mortgage to or not, then do we perpetuate it and it becomes bias and scale. And if we do not have diverse people building these algorithms, we don't even notice it. The other thing, and I think um, this is something that the pop quiz illustrates, we're thinking that AI is not biased. It's almost like, well, it's better than humans because we know humans are biased. And yet humans built the AI. So think about that. So what do we do? I think it goes back to education and building our skills, the future of work. And it starts with creating a data literate workforce and a data literate society. We start with data literacy. Where do we stand today? Only 21% of business people, so it's part of their job, describe themselves as data literate. And leaders, business leaders in this space recognize that they have a gap, um, but are moving too slowly to improve it. So what could we do? We could, I think we've made some mistakes, that we have made data literacy more about technical literacy, and we have made people afraid of data. And that they're worried about asking dumb questions because the technology has been hard. So this is um, an example of ThoughtSpot, a company I joined five years ago after working in this space for 30 years because I felt like it was the first product that I've seen that makes data easy enough for every business person, every citizen. It uses natural language processing, either with GPT, the APIs, not the chat part, because we can't trust that, so that you could ask simple questions, most popular pets on the West Coast. Here, you see always, it's going a bit quickly, always human in the loop, so did it get it right? It will show you the SQL or the keywords. I just want to point out this. It tells you it's AI generated. So that transparency that it's AI generated before you decide that you pin it to your official dashboard. So if we can tackle data literacy with easier to use technical tools and focus more on the business definitions, can we and should we move more now to AI literacy. And I believe we should. An example, let's go back last fall, 
Hurricane Ian, as it was barreling towards the west coast in Florida, this cone of certainty, something that the National Weather Service has used for decades, it's based on predicted models. It's not a sure thing. And understanding even that the US model versus the European model, the European model has been more accurate for severe storms, I don't know why. Um, it was definitely more accurate with Hurricane Sandy. But the people that were living in Fort Myers, so the, the cone of certainty was Tampa, a little further north. Fort Myers was just on the edge. They did not think that they would get hit. And so citizens did not understand that it's a prediction, it's not a sure thing, and that there is a mar margin for error, error. Let's take this further with math. Now, as students check their math homework with chat GPT, if you go back a few months ago, taking 241 minus negative 241 plus one, Chat GPT gave with the utmost confidence that the correct answer was 484. As of this week, it is now correct and it's explaining the steps. This is where I see it as a good education tool when it's right. Seemingly with the GPT-4 model, it's less adept at math. So we're still figuring this out and the student, students don't always know. What can we do? Some mitigation strategies. So we had a lively debate yesterday. Um, should we, and I think I'm not seeing um, her here today, but we had a lively debate. Is education enough? I think education is one ingredient, but it has to start earlier. It has to start in primary schools. It has to definitely high schools. So this is where some groups that it would be wonderful for practitioners and parents, aunts, uncles to get more involved. Data Science for All is actually open sourcing training materials to teachers. It's then up to the teacher to implement it in their classrooms, but I think this is the way we scale ahead of different states actually coming up with core curriculums. A group that ThoughtSpot and I have worked with now for three years the Mark Cuban Foundation, their AI boot camps. In fact, last weekend, um, I was in California as a mentor for one of these. They're happening now across the US. About 300 students in more than a dozen different cities from schools that are at a less economic advantage. They may not have laptops in their classrooms. They may not have computer science courses. And Mark Cuban specifically looks for ensuring diversity of, of students by ethnicity and by gender. And why does this matter? <coughs> if we think about who's building these models and the makeup of the data science profession and the data profession, the degree that it is comprised of women is only 26% in the US, according to the US uh, Department of Labor Statistics. And that has been flat for 20 years. If we look at um, African Americans, it is only 9%, and that has been flat. If we look at the Latinx community, it's 8%, and it has improved from 4% 20 years ago. So if you think about some of the examples, the kidney transplants, understanding bias at scale and where it starts. We need diverse workers working on this. So this is something that the Mark Cuban Foundation tries to address at the high school level. Women in Data, Women Leaders in Data and AI are two other organizations that I think um, are doing great things here. So I'd like to ask you, what are you doing education-wise with your stakeholders? So we have a poll. If you can go ahead and respond to that. How many of you have done ideation sessions, um, and Jenny, does everyone know how to access the poll, or do you want to tell them? Thank you. So if you go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot C-O-M, and type in the use code, which is 57501452. 57501452. 
And so just looking at these initial results, and we'll leave this open and hopefully share this afterwards, is generative AI? Yes, Susan. Can we get the code one more time? It's there. It's, it's on there. the end of the website. <laughs> yeah, we, we can't see Okay, that. the code is 57501452. Yeah, so is generative AI already in production? Or we've had education and ideation sessions with our stakeholders. We're not planning to, or we are planning to offer one in the next three months. 3%, no formal plans, or they are more than three months out. So um, we'll be sure to share the final results. I will, so maybe not surprisingly, this group is skewing in a more positive direction than some of the other workshops I've done um, in the last few months, one at um, NYU and one at Women Leaders in Data and AI. So I'm going to say at least, let's round up, about 60% of you have, are either already in production or you've done an ideation workshop. The 60%, I'm very happy with that. The 40%, no formal plans, you're scaring me, and I'm sorry, I don't think your business is going to survive. Why? <laughs> you are far too late, far too late for how quickly this is moving. So I want to take some of you back. I'm going to go back in time, about 25 years, and I'm going to ask you, do you recognize this sound? <coughs> for eight years, went back to business school to get my MBA, um, and my final exam question in a marketing class was, should, should the Yellow Pages enter the internet? And I, you're, you're laughing, like, of course they should. Of course they should. Um, well, my, so it was Rice University, known as the Harvard of the South. <laughs> I'm sure if it was a Harvard professor, maybe they would have disagreed, but my professor gave me a C and said, Cindy, the internet will never be mainstream. Dial-up is simply too slow. We know who was right, okay? But I think we're at this stage again where we have to bring our imagination. We have to bring our imagination and the idea, reset workflows, the art of the possible, and we are going to see new value, new businesses created at a faster pace than Netflix destroying Blockbuster, or some of the travel industries, Expedia, um, Th Thomas Cook Travel in the UK. Uh, we're gonna see new businesses destroyed and created more quickly. So back in February, I wrote these predictions that throughout 2023, generative AI will be infused in the data and analytics and AI workflow. And it really will be data products by business domain. So bringing the business domains is very important. The opportunities are only limited by our, our imagination. That's why I think it's so important for you to do ideation sessions with your stakeholders, and it starts with imagination of what is possible, but also what could go wrong. So the first movers will have an outsized advantage, and it's the first movers who always pay attention to the ethics and have some of those governance uh, committees in place. So if you think about the whole analytics and AI workflow, it starts with capturing the data capturing the data increasingly by images via bots or modeling the data, the ability to apply domain-specific synonyms 
This is something Bloomberg, with their large language models, is working on, or ZS Associates in healthcare. And then the AI-generated insights with a natural language processing interface, like you saw uh, with ThoughtSpot, and then closing the loop from insight to action, writing back to the operational systems. So if I have a stock out of a hot selling product, I get that AI generated insight and writing it back to the order system. This is how generative AI is changing the data and analytics landscape. I'm gonna take one domain that I think everyone can relate to in the retail and CPG industry. There's estimates that generative AI will contribute 2.6 to 4.4 trillion in GDP per year. That's bigger than the size of the UK GDP. And I was at an event at the New York Stock Exchange this week. The head of AI from IBM said 16 trillion, but he didn't give a time period. So I don't know, either way, it's a lot but it's a question of where. And this is why you need the ideation workshops. Is it consumer research? Is that going to give you the biggest impact? Or is it augmented reality, assisted customer shopping? So even already, we see AI assisted, you can try on your Le Levi's jeans or jackets, or uh, Bobby Brown, their lipstick matcher is AI assisted. Very good. What we're not sure, the less impactful, procurement and suppliers. So picking your first use case, understanding the risk, go, I, we like to say get a quick win, go with high value, lowest risk, show the art of the possible, rinse, repeat, and scale. This also is impacting jobs more quickly than the job <coughs> descriptions can keep up with. So historically, we had the idea of a chief data officer. This now is becoming the chief data and analytics officer, or like, for example, Colgate, the chief data and insight officer. ETL developers, thing of the past, now it's really about the data engineer, or those who understand the business more, an analytics engineer, I think it was 20 years ago, Tom Davenport, DJ Patel declared the data scientist as the sexiest job of the 21st century. I have written that the analytics engineer is the new sexiest job of the 21st century. But that was before GPT came out, so it might be prompt engineer, we'll see. <laughs> and then dashboard developers, thing of the past, it's really about an insight analyst or a DBA, it's really about a cloud data architect a couple other roles to think of, a data fluency coach, and this is now mandates at board levels where CEOs are saying to me, Cindy, how do I improve the data fluency of my workforce? You heard from Zach yesterday, Data Camp, great organization, having a partnership also with higher um, institutions of higher ed or consultancies is another way. I am thinking that the data fluency coach will evolve, oh, and a change management champion as well. So will prompt engineer stay? I don't know, we're, too er we're a little early for that. But I think going from a data fluency coach to an AI fluency coach is an important evolution to think about. One thing that we are not talking enough about is AI's impact on the environment. And I dare say that they are talking about this more in Europe than in the US. But if we think about our digital footprints, as it is, our digital footprints account for 5% of electricity consumption in the world. This was before generative AI. Training GPT 3.5 created 500 metric tons of CO2 emissions. As a comparison, you could drive to the moon and back, and that's how much CO2 is created, or it's a, a lot of flights. We don't really know what the training of GPT-4 contributed to CO2, but being aware of this, um, I think is important, and revealing what did the cost of that AI-generated image do to the environment is important. So far, 
the way these LLM producers are reporting is degree of accuracy um, but, and, and the cost. And they don't all report the cost. But if you think about it, look at the number of parameters of the training data for uh, GPT 3.5, 175 billion parameters. Whereas GPT-4, 1.76 trillion parameters. If you're working in healthcare or financial services, is that necessary? Is it more efficient from both a cost and a carbon footprint and environmental view path to say, just take 50 billion from Bloomberg? So I think this is an area that we as a society have to pay more attention to. So to wrap up, my recommended actions for people working in this space, we don't want you thinking that cows actually create um, and drink milk. They create milk. <laughs> Start with those ideation workshops. Educate your key stakeholders. And then make sure that you do have an AI review board. Bring in ethical hackers. Bring in people with more evil minds than you might have. And bring in, um, whether it's civil organizations, people that might be at risk for disparate impact for the AI you, uh, AI you create. Plan for new roles and skills, and you're going to have to train them yourselves. You cannot wait for higher ed or even public ed in the secondary level to move fast enough for this. Partner with educational institutions. Be proactive on the financial and environmental costs of generative AI. We talk a lot about FinOps. I think FinOps will evolve to LLM Ops and to environmental ops. I'm going to take a quote from the new chief data officer at Harvard, Katya Walsh. Katya said this quote when she was actually at Levi's. Think big, start small, but scale fast. And then, for everyone, you can do this with your families, two movies, documentaries that I absolutely love, Coded Bias and Social Dilemma. And I think it's something you can watch with your teams. We did this um, internally at ThoughtSpot, had a very lively discussion. I did make my 20-something-year-old um, children watch it as well, because I don't think they understood enough of what's actually happening. So with that, I thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. Yes, Laura. Um, I noticed that all the problems that you mentioned, although they are caused by technologies, these are ethical questions, the ethical problems. On the other hand, I noticed that the educational tools that you are arguing for are technical. So here's a suggestion. I have no idea what you mean by an ethical hacker. Hire ethicists. Ethics is not about your moral intuition. It is something you can study at university for years. The qualifications that you get are as important as any other thing in this. That brings me to the second thing. When you talk about a governance committee and the other measures that you were sort of arguing for, I feel that that is actually misleading into what it would actually take to have a governance and ethics governance framework integrated into your organization to solve these problems will take much more than that. It takes principles, it takes guidelines, it takes bias audits, it takes having um, ethics people at different levels integrated into this. It takes all these many, many elements integrated into the, dis the development cycle to a level that I think is misrepresented, misrepresented in the in the very few, very loose suggestions that you just gave. Okay, thank you for your feedback, Laura. I very much appreciate, yes, having an ethicist as part of the team, but I would also like everyone to have ethics in mind as they're building these things. I, I, I can envision an organization where it is part of everyone's job rather than just a specialist job, but for now, it remains specialist. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, oh, we're out of time. Can I take one more? Or, um, sorry. Hi, Kasia. I don't know why my name is so okay. long here. Uh, you mentioned data fluency coach. 
Could you just elaborate what kind of fluency you have in mind there? So is it like very technical or is it just the explain, <coughs> like explaining the things to people? Yeah, so it's not technical. That I think is a mistake that we have made in the past. And it starts with coming up, uh, agreeing a common vocabulary. So if I'm working in life sciences, TRX is a synonym for revenue. But then it also is applying, how do I interpret this particular chart? Recognizing that correlation is not causation, understanding medians versus averages. So there's different levels of data fluency that we want depending on the role. All business people should have a minimum acceptable level of data fluency. Data scientists will have a higher level that includes understanding where the data comes from and the degree of biases in the data sets. So we're out of time. Um, on behalf of, thank you, Harvard, for having me here and C3 Catalyst. Um, and I will be here via the break if you have, or whatever, whatever's next. Thank you. All right, just let's move very quickly to our second session uh, featuring Zhao Wu and uh,